Hi, my name is Kate Russell. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Sydney in the Faculty of Education and Social Work. I'm presenting on behalf of myself and my student, Tracy Attenborough, on negotiating new sporting experiences and inquiry into the factors influencing men's participation in netball. If you have any further queries, you can contact me on my email address, which is below. So let me just tell you a little bit about the project itself. We really wanted to investigate the ways in which men, in particular, negotiate the participation in traditionally female-dominated sport of netball. And we wanted to consider the ways in which men might have to renegotiate their masculinity by participating in this activity. So we were just very interested in the overall ways in which men have chosen to participate in a sport considered to be mainly for females and how they go about managing their ideas and their sense of themselves. So we start from an acknowledgement that sport is a constructive process and that it, sport is a gendered space whereby individuals' identity, identities are shaped and constructed by the participation and through the participation and by the observation of, other, of others. And so we recognise as well that traditional sports regulate those gendered performances. So certain types of activities become acknowledged to be feminine, some become acknowledged to be masculine, and then we tend to attribute certain characteristics to those qualities. So masculinity in terms of being powerful, being very competitive and aggressive, whereas feminine is more about um, the aesthetic quality and grace, for example. But there has been some recent research which kind of argues that new sports and, and emerging sports actually have the potential for alternative negotiations of gender. And Harlan and Green argue that some of these types of sports might actually become gender neutral. And this was based on, on work previously from, from authors such as, as Wheaton, who argued that sports such as um, snow, um, windsurfing and skateboarding in particular can actually, they have their own different sets of rules and guidelines which are, which are much less restrictive and in that way can actually allow for people to negotiate different ways of, of, of being feminine, different ways of being masculine. So people embody different kind of approaches to their, their gender in that way. And so it might be possible that, a, that men's netball as a new sport might be able to create an, an alternative way to negotiate gender too. And so that's really the starting point for our study. We also acknowledge that um, work in this area has tended to focus on women who participate in traditionally male sports, like rugby, like cricket, like football, for example. And so there is, in particular, a gap for and a need to really explore men who choose to participate in traditionally female sports. And there's an interesting study here by Shimon Laveau, who looked at men who participate in rhythmic gymnastics. And this was an interesting um, study because it identified the way in which these, these men were able to negotiate the masculinity by focusing on the skill acquisition and the skill execution that their sport required rather than necessarily focusing on the grace and the style of the process. And so that started to give us some ideas about how men might be able to negotiate the masculinity. Um, netball as a sport is incredibly popular in Australia, but the development of the sport holds certain discourses for us about the way in which the sport is supposed to be played. So Trigus has done some interesting work looking at the idea of netball as a form of female restraint. So female participants are actually constrained within netball because of the, the limitation for movement between the zones, the limitation of movement once they hold the ball, those sorts of things. So for Tracy and I in particular, it was energy interesting to see how men would be able to negotiate a sport where they're generally used to, and I guess the male version of netball would be basketball um, in a very kind of crude way, whereby they're allowed a lot more movement. Certainly in Australia, there are around about 45,000 men who do participate in netball, either as part of a mixed competition or men-only competition. So there's certainly um, scope there for really trying to examine this, this new um, participation. And for, for us, it was even though Wellard might argue that sport has long been considered this natural arena for, for men to demonstrate their masculinity, men's netball certainly does able to create a, particular, a potential site for gender conflict because it does tend to confront those stereotypical perceptions of appropriate masculine and feminine behaviours through that kind of participation. And so that's one of the things that we were, we were interested in exploring. Um, and also we wanted to also then to consider Butler's notion of performativity in relation to these things, which I'm going to explore in the next slide.
So first, I'll give you some brief details on the participants. It was a very small and specific study. There were five interviews with male netballers. The men were aged between 18 and 35. All had varying levels of expertise, but they all had at least one year's experience of competitive netball participation. And by that, I mean at least at the state level. So these were all um, state level performers. The study took place in New South Wales in Australia over a period of two months. So when we come to explore this notion of, of Butler's performativity, um, post-structural researchers try to really attempt to understand this dynamic relationship between the self and the social and try to then to identify the dis discourses that give meaning to day-to-day -day, um, negotiations. And Foucault talks about discourses being the practices that systematically form the objects of which they speak and also how they act as times as a, as a regulated practice so unwritten rules help to produce and then regulate individuals who happen to embody that discourse. And, and Wright certainly kind of acknowledges then that some discourses become more legitimate than others and are taken up more readily, for example. Um, Judith Butler drew on kind of Foucault's notions and argued that actually gender is a form of forced cultural performance. And this is principally guided by this notion of compulsive heterosexuality. And she argues that gender is something that we do rather than something that we are. And that this is kind of embedded in ourselves through these ri ritualized repetition of conventions, so these repetitive acts. And in some way, this then helps to create a core identity, even though it might actually be a bit of an illusion, a bit of a no myth. But, but through these repetitions, they become part of who we are. And so we start to see this notion and an understanding of doing girl and doing boy. And we, we wanted to try to attempt to place that... Um, that type of analysis on, on the material that we were finding with the men in terms of being able to do male netballer. And that's how we decided to, to frame the findings that are about to be presented. So what we find straight away, and probably not surprising, is that there was a great deal of stigma attached to men's participation in netball from both men and women. And for men it was really about um, kind of ridiculing their, their participation and kind of and demasculizing their process by making comments about, you know, do you shave your do you shave your legs? Do you wear a skirt? All things which are traditionally connected to a more feminine kind of appearance. But what was interesting as well here was that women were also very kind of clear in their in their challenging of, of men's participation in netball. And Richard certainly noticed that the women who were around him would often kind of make comments or suggestions that would imply, you know, what the hell are these guys doing here? So also challenging their right to actually be present in that environment in the first place. And it's interesting here because this is simply mirroring what women tend to be experiencing when they, they participate in traditionally male sports, that men are very reluctant to allow, to allow them to participate. And yet we are seeing the same thing here with men trying to participate in netball too. We then go on to explore this notion around sexuality and this idea of, of safety in numbers. Um, and this kind of operates on two levels. On the one hand, we have this this need, this this desire for the men to certainly present themselves as being very masculine, but also very heterosexual in that in that process. And so, while they recognise that they would often receive gay comments about their participation, Stan in particular kind of just says, "Well, you know, it's all fine. I go to the netball courts and I get to stand around and, and look at women in, in really, really kind of short skirts." And so he's representing it as almost like a heterosexual practice that actually he participates and he gains all of this heterosexual benefit through that process. And similarly then with like Alex is kind of saying, well, what's the big deal? I go and play a sport where I can see half-naked girls who are fit. And so they're emphasizing their masculinity through this process, emphasizing their heterosexuality. But on the other hand, we also know then Harry recognizes that the sport is itself identified as a potentially gay sport but actually in that way it creates a safe haven for men who are gay to be able to play without fear of being accepted by their participants. And then we go on to explore this notion of the performing the masculine so here we're connecting to Butler's notions of performativity even more and what's really interesting here is that in particular with with Harry he, he recognized that these men are going in and they're they're hyper-masculizing their performance by saying, you know, it's all about the competition, we all have huge egos, it's all about who can be better. And he even uses this phrase, you know, we can be gods, like in this environment. So perhaps in other male-dominated sports, they don't feel that they're able to be 
as good, um, as dominant as they are actually in this particular context. And here he really recognizes that, look, there are actually fewer participants, so we can excel and we can stand out. And actually that's really, really important. And in terms of representing his masculinity, being successful is obviously a key aspect here. And they also kind of relate this to, so the men relate this to, this notion of being athletic. So in their discussions, they really emphasise the, the physical qualities needed to play netball well, that they really emphasise their athleticness, that they, they recognise that they were probably actually better athletes than the women who played. It was just that they were still trying to catch up with all of the technical aspects of the sport. Um, and also some of the men recognise that actually because they had skills in other sports, for, for example basketball, that they were able to bring that in and even though they perhaps may have started later in, in the day in terms of their, their, their netball participation, they were able to actually be much better because they had all of these skills prior to that. And then Harry also then goes on to recognise again another way of performing masculine through the sledging kind of process that they were able to kind of really get into other people's head and that was a real benefit. So they're finding all of these different ways to be able to negotiate their performances in, in the sport of netball. And just then to summarise, it's very clear that men really did negotiate the playing of netball. They really enjoyed the sport but they did this through a number of ways. They certainly heterosexualised their practice, so in that kind of sense to view women in a sexual way. And they did this alongside recognising and acknowledging that that netball for men did actually create a safe space for other forms of sexuality and that while observers might try and label all men to be um, homosexual in that particular way, they were able to challenge it quite easily by presenting the heterosexualness and the desire of women who played in those particular sports while also acknowledging the space for gay men in that way. They also kind of recognised a number of ways where they were actually able to perform the male athlete. So here a clear emphasis on the athletic ability, the physicality of the sport that they brought to it, and actually perhaps in some way constructing the male netballer as more than the female netballer, that they were actually bringing something new, something different to the actual sport. So overall, this, this relatively small study was able to identify a number of strategies, a number of processes by which men were able to negotiate their masculinity and still be able to play the sport of netball. The next two slides will show my references and again if you do want to get in touch with me please just email me. Thank you.